de départ. <rire> voilà, content de tous les salles ici là. Et puis, euh, je suis très contente de pouvoir participer à cette, à cette fameuse présentation. Euh, pour moi, c'est une longue histoire déjà avec BSF. <rire> je crois que ça a démarré euh, dans la pédagogie, dans l'éducation. On parle toujours de la formation des enseignants, la formation des formateurs, la formation des, des gestions de collègues. Euh, et on parle aussi d'outils pédagogiques, de contenu, de manuels scolaires, de livres, de dictionnaires, de, de notices, de dépliants. Et puis, euh, je travaille là-dessus dans différents projets. Entre autres, au Rwanda, où on a fait un, un projet manuel scolaire qui était passionnant. Voilà. Et puis, au Burundi, on s'est rencontrés, on s'est retrouvés dans notre projet avec des questions. Comment donner accès, sans passer par les marchés publics, l'importation de livres, les faire sur place, ça prenait beaucoup de temps, etc. Et J'ai appris à connaître BSF au Burundi. Et euh, c'était 2014-2015 voilà. Alors, on est en 2018 et les contrats sont signés au Burundi. BSF travaille avec un projet d'enseignement technique et, et formation professionnelle et j'en suis en que ça, ça marche très bien. Donc, c'est un plaisir de voir que ça fonctionne, que ça fonctionne bien. Euh, c'est un plaisir aussi, je crois, de, de, de combiner la digitalisation et tout le potentiel digital avec non seulement le contenu, mais aussi euh, l'approche et puis euh, la liaison, euh, le, le lien avec tout. Euh, maybe, je dis la présentation, mais c'est aussi important. Je crois que l'approche systémique, l'approche que vous avez, prend en compte aussi bien les différents acteurs, le contenu, la formation, euh, le hardware, le software, et tout ça en open source avec comme volonté la réduction de la pauvreté. Je crois que c'est rare et une opportunité pour nous. Voilà, alors je suis un peu rapide, j'ai introduit. Maintenant, peut-être que les gens veulent se présenter comme ça, euh, et puis vous présenterez l'autre ouais. floor is yours. <rire> oui. On va d'abord euh, se présenter chacun. Tout au fond, peut-être Je m'appelle Théa et je travaille ici pour le Centre de Santé de Paris. Monsieur Santé Niger, du coup. Santé Niger. C'est bon pour moi. Et donc, moi, je suis Barbara Schack. Euh, je suis en charge du développement de Bibliothèques sans frontières. Notamment, je représente BSF auprès de, de nos partenaires euh, les plus stratégiques. Euh, et Dimitri est ici pour représenter l'organisation en Belgique, à la fois parce qu'on fait des projets en Belgique, mais aussi euh, pour euh, nouer des contacts comme ceux-ci. Est-ce euh, que je pourrais avoir un show of hands de votre préférence si je parle en français pour influencer votre choix, je préfère parler en anglais. <laughs> no, uh, but honestly, does anybody prefer if I speak in English? Mm. Does anybody prefer if I speak in French? Okay. Then I'm going to do quite a lot of this in English, uh, and I might switch uh, for people who are going to see this online and who find this confusing, my apologies. <laughs> Um, so, I'm here to present Libraries Without Borders. C'est vrai que ça fait étrange après avoir parlé en français pendant tout ce temps. Euh, et plus précisément, euh, de parler... Ben, Aujourd'hui, c'est un digital talk. This is a digital talk. Um, and so, we're going to be talking about the question of knowledge and how digital tools 
uh, initiatives and innovations enable the question of uh, accessibility to knowledge and how this transforms development objectives. So I'm from Libraries Without Borders and Libraries Without Borders has identified one big challenge, which is that more than half of the world is not connected to the internet. Uh, and as an organization who has identified that access to information is a major lever for people to actually be able to address the challenges they face. So the challenges they face to find their way, the challenges they face to learn, the challenges they face around uh, their health, their nutrition, not having access to the world's greatest information resource is a big challenge. And when we say that more than half of the world population doesn't have access to internet, we mean two things. Access is both a technological question, an infrastructure question, a grid work question, so it's also linked to the question of access to electricity. Um, but it's also a challenge in terms of usability, what we call accessibility, uh, meaning having the technical access to the internet and knowing how to use it, knowing what you could use it for. There's the question of being able to actually find an answer on Google. There's even the question of knowing that you can find an answer on Google. And that's also one of the main elements that is creating a huge divide and a growing divide between uh, for the people who are were already the most vulnerable and who see their vulnerability exacerbated because they lack the access to that information resource. Now, what this means is that since at Libraries Without Borders, we're convinced that access to information and inside information, the question of access to education resources is a tremendous um, input towards all development goals. This problem of inequality in terms of access to the internet and access to digital resources is a huge challenge in terms of development in general. And one of the things that we want to work on is reducing that divide, both on the question of technical access, but also on the question of accessibility and knowing how to use these resources as an individual, as a community, as an education professional, etc. Now, often people at this point will say, yeah, but is that really the priority, knowing that everybody's going really fast, Google is starting to put things in the air so that people are going to be able to access internet, etc. So instead of answering the question of internet's going to solve everything, you're wasting your time, I'm going to ask you, if you th think of answers to the question, if there's internet everywhere, does that solve the question? Have you yourself, in the projects that you're working in, if I tell you there's going to be internet in five years, what would you answer to that? to see if there are some elements. Like if you go out in the projects that you're in, do you actually have access to internet? The people that you're working with in terms of training, in terms of education, in terms of health access, do you really believe that internet is gonna solve everything in five years? No, and do you, do you have ideas of why? Yes? It improves like this, um, it's, it's much more manageable. Indeed. Um, and I'm going to go one step before. Right now, when we're saying there's going to be internet everywhere, first of all, that's a highly unequal conversation. In France today, there's still not internet everywhere. So there's not going to be internet everywhere, even in Senegal, which is the number one priority development country, the most advanced in French-speaking Africa. Um, there's not going to be internet everywhere within the next five years. Second of all, even when there is internet, that doesn't mean it's actually accessible and more importantly, it's not necessarily affordable. And before, as soon as the question of technical access is solved, we're going to see emerge the problem that already exists, which is a question of affordability of data. 
So it's not because you have technical access to information that you have the capacity to access the information that you want because it's eating up your broadband budget. And a lot of the amazing, so there's that one, and then there's the question of actually finding the resources that are relevant even once internet access arrives. So with internet access doesn't necessarily come the actual access to the information we're interested in. It's access to the internet. So these are some of the elements that, uh, that, that shape what we mean when we're talking about access to information and a digital divide and how we can solve that challenge. Um, especially considering that when we were saying before that there is a tremendous wealth of information that is relevant for education, for health, et cetera, et cetera, these resources, such as online university courses uh, or big databases of uh, health procedures uh, that the WHO is creating, et cetera, these resources are becoming heavier and heavier in terms of weight of data. So instead of you know, using floppy disks, we would now need entire hard drives to download all of Coursera's, Coursera's material for learning entrepreneurship and accountability in Arabic, let's say. These resources exist. It's not with your two giga, 500 mega uh, plan that you're gonna be able to access these again and again and again. So this is some of the sort of overall elements to ground our conversation today around some of the tools that Libraries Without Borders is working on. So, at Libraries Without Borders, we're convinced that what a library does, what a library can do, is be a space for empowerment around all development goals. Because it is one of the few free spaces open to the entire community, usable by all the stakeholders in the community, the schools, the NGOs, etc., for access to information. Now in that, we also include the question of uh, libraries that are in health centers, libraries that are in school, et cetera. A library is a resource center and it is a community center where development goals can be achieved through access to the proper, uh, to the proper content. Um, and there's some in French as well, if you prefer that version. Uh, if you speak both languages, you have lots of different inputs from this slide. Um, now, why, what do we do then knowing that this is sort of the vision in terms of access to information. Libraries Without Borders is a nonprofit organization uh, based globally in Paris with uh, independent uh, structures in Belgium and in the US and operational office, offices in the Middle East, in, uh, in the Great Lakes, in Colombia. We have a, a global reach. And we implement projects, usually with the existing ecosystem, so uh, the ministries of education, civil society, Save the Children, ICRC, etc. We implement projects with them to enable them to reach development objectives. So it can be a psychosocial support for <coughs> Rohingya refugees in Bangladesh, for example, um, and achieving these objectives through access to knowledge. And to do this, each program has three main pillars. The question of where you're gonna access the information, the question of creating safe spaces, the, creation, the question of creating spaces that are adapted to humanitarian logistics. Uh, some of the things that I'll be presenting later and the brochures that you find here are kits to set up a multimedia center when there's no electricity, no internet, and you're in the middle of a disaster. Or for libraries in Paris to do outreach programs in public parks. This question of being where users actually are and creating the space in the appropriate place. The second brick of all programs is the question of contents. Um, Libraries Without Borders was founded uh, over 10 years ago on this understanding that there's something there was something wrong at the time with how cooperation around book donations were done. It's not about shipping books. It's about identifying for each content context which contents are relevant to that context. Of course, in terms of language, we don't ship French books all over the world. Uh, it's, each project has a different set of languages. Um, it's also about uh, age groups, about literacy levels, about interests, uh, about uh, around opportunities. Um, the program we're doing right now with en Enable, and I have finally learned the proper pronunciation of Enable, I'm very happy, um, is around professional training, mainly for youth and young adults within Burundi. Well, even within Burundi, with 
a reasonably simple language base in Kirundi and French, though I'm simplifying it, even there, the different centers are teaching different things, so the contents are going to be different. And in each project, the identification <coughs> of what are the objectives, what are going to be the contents that respond to these objectives, is the foundation of our process. We call it pedagogical engineering. And a lot of the times, there's an opportunity to foster creation of new contents, creation of contents by teachers, for example, but also by <coughs> children themselves. So uh, in protection programs in, in Burundi, actually, uh, but also in the Middle East, youth have started making films around their life or around some of the trauma that they're working on. So they created a, what we called zombie films around being haunted by the violence that had happened in the past. Now, this wasn't something that we directed. It was it, ideas that emerged from creating a space where anybody could do whatever they wanted. And so some of the ideas that emerged from the youth themselves was, hey, let's make movies. And then when they made movies, these are the themes that mattered to them. And that's the unique element that you have within a cultural learning information space is that these things can emerge in a way that's very different from a sort of top-down usual protection or education program because libraries are places of opportunities. So that was for content. And the last part is that actually what I just said doesn't really matter if there aren't actually trained what we called mediators, facilitators between the contents and the users. Knowing that facilitators can be the users themselves, but somebody that transforms the books from a bookshelf collecting dust to an actual activity that is relevant. This is particularly key in the, ca in the case of digital programs because there have been many programs where we would ship digital tools like we used to ship books and expect magic to happen. Magic does happen because digital tools generate curiosity, but they're not actually reaching the transformational education, for example, objectives that you could reach if you actually have a teacher that knows how to use a computer and knows how to use a computer to show um, a, a, an audio book about legends of Somalia in a Somali refugee camp, two kids who, have never, who were born in the camp and have never been to Somalia, and transform that into an opportunity to talk about heritage, etc. That's how you transform a content into an actual cultural activity that has a development objective. So transforming cultural materials into <coughs> social change. This means you know, activities guides, <coughs> it means initial training, and it also means continuous training and so enabling our partners to rethink how they're using the spaces they've created as the situation evolves. Uh, some people would call this sort of user-centered design, and these are some of the methodologies that we use a lot. Um, we work in a lot of places around the world. Our humanitarian programs um, started in Haiti as the earthquake happened. Um, the spot is not there anymore because not, we're not working there anymore, but this is where sort of UNICEF reached out to us because we were there and started thinking about how you cre can create spaces that are safe and engaging. And they have since developed to the locations that you see here, in, including programs around the south of Europe and France. Um, and to add to that, we also have, sorry, this is a bit too animated, uh, programs uh, for education and learning objectives, a little bit everywhere in the world, including things around training, around uh, public health information to youth uh, in east of France, etc. So our, our, the scope of where we work is very broad, but the methodology is always the same. Now. How do we actually use digital tools in the context where we are? One of the tools that we have developed is called uh, Kumbuk. It comes from Kumbuka, which means to remember in Swahili. Um, now, the good news is it's actually here. So you can actually look at it afterwards. The idea is that in a specific context, a, li uh, a library or a database of resources will be identified, audio, video, PDFs, manuals, uh, guides, etc. So all this type of media files that you could have preloaded onto a hard drive, which is in there, which you would see down here. 
and accessed by a Wi-Fi signal. If you turned on your phone right now, you would see there's a Wi-Fi signal called KB something. UNINA is the name of one of the projects, locations of the projects, and organized in packages that can then be used by facilitators. So that depends from one project to the next. There'll be the set of videos around um, mathematics for primary school children in French. Or there will be resources for uh, community engagement for youth or learning how to code or things like that. And so the work is done around packaging these resources not as a big database, but as tracks that facilitators are actually able to use. You connect with your computer or your phone or your tablet, and actually I can show you right, is this still okay. So if you were to connect here to KBGRC Ioannina, uh, and then go to a browser and try to connect to enable.be, it wouldn't work because it's not connected to the internet. But then if you go to, so http dot slash slash kumbuk.lan, and this is my opportunity to do a little bit of general knowledge. LAN means local area network, unlike com, which is the rest of the internet, or BE, which is Belgium, etc. You would arrive to an interface that looks like this. This is a, a popuri. <laughs> of contents that I use for demos so that you can see that there are different languages and things like that. Uh, but basically all of these bricks show are, are a set of various media. So for example, this is a set of a PDF and a number of videos around the question of drug use. Uh, it, doesn't it doesn't work? Uh, did, did you, one of the things is that when you went on your navigator, you mean, one of the things is that I will I'll show you on a slide later the exact things that need to be typed, but there needs to be HTTP dot slash slash. One of the reasons for this is that Google has hijacked all the phones, and when you're typing this, instead of bringing you to the address that you asked, it takes you to Google. But since we're not connected to the internet, it doesn't, actu it doesn't actually work. So you need to type in the full address, including HTTP dot slash slash. This is uh, now solved in the new versions because there's an automatic pop-up like when you go to the airport and it sort of brings you to. So in these are, is there, there is mainly, so there are these different sets of contents. The media center includes all of them. And the idea is that we build from a database of t more than 20,000 contents in 25 different languages, as well as look for new resources in each project to create content packages for each program. And these are then searchable by types of media, by language, et cetera. And what is very neat is that you can not only connect, let's, let's find a video. You can not only read the video, so conflict sensitive education. Um, you can watch the video or you can download it and leave with it. And this is particularly useful in programs like in the south of Europe where there are things like maps and people are connecting, uh, people in some of the, the migrant centers are connecting, downloading resources, language courses, for example, and then moving along to new locations, if only because they are being allocated from one hotel to the next and things are rotating. So the idea is that it's both a center for resources that are accessed in activities, and there's a facilitator that's showing these different materials, but it's also a self-learning center in which people can leave with their resources. And in Central Africa, for example, teachers come to the teacher training center to access new materials and go back to the more remote locations where they are with the resources that they have then acquired. These are media files but there, is, there are also entire platforms. Now these platforms are not downloadable because they're bigger than a telephone, so it's, a, it's an entire platform, such as Wikipedia, uh, the Khan Academy, that Digital Bart very much, uh, ethics young, likes very much. Um, I take this opportunity to let you know that Libraries Without Borders has translated the Khan Academy into French, and this is one of our made programs in Belgium. We're training teachers to use the Khan Academy in their pedagogy, if I am correct. And the idea is that you are then able to connect and find the entire 
course uh, of mathematics from early grade all the way to early university. Uh, and if you're in a, in a country where it's in English, there are a lot more resources than that. But Khan Academy is just one among the millions of resources that are available in the world. Um, and I have, I think, anticipate on a lot of the things I wanted to say, but one of those things is that this is a server. You need viewing devices. And so some of the programs we have, uh, we're working with libraries or schools or universities or health centers that already have an IT lab and we're just adding a digital library. But there is, especially in emergency contexts or in flexible contexts, it's actually a kit in which you also have viewing devices like tablets and a projector so that you can do training uh, trainings and a case to both charge and use all of this. And we're researching right now how we can transform that into a more of a ba backpack setup for locations where you need to go with a motorbike or things like that. Um, what's really great about having packs that include tablets is that this enables us to add an additional type of media, which are apps, in which uh, we're then able to use great wealths of resources in terms of apps for learning a great number of things. And that's part of the constant research in terms of what are the good and useful digital resources, because that's one of the main challenges. There's a great, of, a great array of things all over the world, but finding the right ones for each context is the challenge and the expertise that we have developed. 